evening. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleesby, is the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining us, whether you're uh, here in person or uh, joining us online. Uh, for anyone who's uh, visiting the MHS, either virtually or, or in person for the first time, uh, we are the first historical society in America, uh, dating back to 1791. Uh, we've been collecting and preserving uh, material related to American uh, and Massachusetts history for the past 232 years. As I like to say, we're old enough that when we were founded, uh, our first president uh, wrote to Paul Revere and Paul Revere wrote back. So uh, in the, the past 232 years, we've amassed a, an amazing collection. We have about 14 million uh, manuscript pages in our collection, including the papers of three of the first six U.S. presidents. Um, so, uh, some of that will be relevant to our, our program this evening. Um, we also host a wide variety of programs, um, and as the weather is getting warmer, we hope that we'll see more and more people joining us uh, in person. Uh, we're only able to hope, host all these programs uh, thanks to the support of our members and donors, and so if you enjoy this evening's program, I hope you'll come back to, to future programs, and I hope you'll consider supporting MHS uh, as well. So this evening, we're happy to host Alex Prudhomme. Uh, who is uh, coming back to MHS after uh, a number of years. Um, he was last here in uh, 2017 and was part of a culinary history series uh, we hosted uh, titled Cooking Boston. I think the subtitle for the program that he was a part of was called uh, Eating Other People's Food. Um, uh, he is a freelance writer whose work appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, and other publications. Uh, he is the co-author uh, of Julia Child's memoir, My Life in France, and has authored or co-authored The French Chef in America, uh, France is a Feast and Born Hungry, among other books. Uh, this evening, he'll be speaking about his latest book, uh, Dinner with the President, Food, Politics, and a History of Breaking Bread at the White House, uh, which dives into figuring out what we can learn from looking at the tastes and styles of 26 American presidents. Uh, this evening, we will concentrate on three who have a connection to Massachusetts. So I hope you can all join me in welcoming Alex. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Nice to see you all here. Um, and thank you to MHS, which is a, just a wonderful resource. Uh, and I hope you all support it. Um, as Gavin mentioned, my book is called Dinner with the President, Food Politics, and the History of Breaking Bread at the White House. Um, and I'll give you a brief talk and then we'll have some questions, I hope, at the end. I encourage you to ask questions. So, like any house, the White House runs on food, but 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is a unique building. At once, the nerve center of the country, a busy office, a decorative arts museum, the only residence of a national leader that invites the public inside, a functioning home, and as Jackie Kennedy put it, an emblem of the American Republic. As a result, the personal and political spheres of the president's house are separated by a very thin membrane. From a bowl of cereal in the private quarters to a cabinet lunch, a mob of screaming children at the Easter egg roll, or a state dinner for royalty, food is usually at the center of things, yet we tend to overlook that. In fact, a meal at the White House is never simply a meal. It's both sustenance and metaphor, a forum for politics and entertainment at the highest level, a series of signs, signals, and stories. Consider Ronald Reagan's jelly beans. His love of the colorful candies explains how he weaned himself from tobacco, judged other people's character, deflected scrutiny with folksy humor, turbocharged the sugar industry, and provided a useful way to communicate with his voters. I like this candy. You like this candy. So vote for me, the jelly beans seemed to say. And people paid attention. Nancy Reagan was highly attuned to this. But when President Reagan downed jelly bellies, labeled ketchup a vegetable, defunded school lunches by one and a half billion dollars on the very same day that Mrs. Reagan acquired an elegant, rather costly 4,000 piece set of bone china, the message seemed to be that 
real vegetables are not as important as sweet substitutes, and the Reagans were out of touch with the public, and they were ridiculed from all quarters. So when you are the president, every bite counts, for better and for worse. So in writing this book, I was struck by how some first families intuitively understand this, uh, that food is a useful political and diplomatic tool, while others are utterly clueless. Canny leaders like Thomas Jefferson, the Roosevelt's, Eisenhower, Kennedy's, Reagan's, and Obama's understood that their choice of guests, menus, and entertainment can influence and amplify their agenda. Less savvy men like John Adams, Andrew Johnson, Woodrow Wilson, or Gerald Ford discovered that a dull party, a drunken speech, or a food fail can undermine their entire administration. So this book was inspired by these kinds of stories, along with the televised documentaries about state dinners that my great aunt Julia Child made in 1967 and 1976, and a private tour that I was given of the White House uh, in 2016, which impacted me in an emotional way that I wasn't expecting. And uh, that day in 2016, all of these factors kind of came together in the back of my mind. And I think the seed for this book was planted then, though I didn't realize it. It took me another two years to get around to starting this book. So I began in the fall of 2018. Uh, it was COVID delayed. Uh, it has finally come out. It came out right before President's Day in February. And it's a book about the food of politics and the politics of food. What, I wondered, with the narrative arc from George Washington and his troops starving at Valley Forge in the very cold winter of 1777 to the, to the days when squirrel stew and roasted possum were considered the height of fine dining, to space age foods like tang, sanka, and pop tarts, to our modern cuisine of kale and taco bowls. What would all of this tell us about our commanders in chief? the state of our union, the industrialization of the nation, and ultimately ourselves. So tonight I'll give you a taste of what I found in the story of three meals from presidents with connections to the wonderful state of Massachusetts. So the first was a party hosted by John Adams on New Year's Day in 1801. After a bumpy 19-day carriage trek from Philadelphia to Washington, Adams arrived to find the president's house unfinished. The door was framed by beautiful ionic columns, but the steps were only half built. Inside, wood shavings littered the mahogany floors. The rooms were cold and damp, despite blazing fire set in all 39 fireplaces in an attempt to dry the still curing walls, which were coated in plaster mixed with hog hair, horse hair, and beer, a foodstuff literally baked into the White House. There was no running water, few lamps, or a toilet, though there was an outhouse. The grounds included scrub brush, shanties, abandoned kilns, and a small vegetable garden. Adams dubbed his new home the Great Castle, partly in jest and partly in tribute. It was unfinished because the new federal capital of Washington, D.C. was itself a work in progress. George Washington helped to design the White House, but he never lived there. And Adams was the first president to uh, live at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Though he'd been exposed to very refined fare as a diplomat in France and Holland and Great Britain, he was descended from flinty Puritans who survived on victuals from New England's rocky soil and wavy coast, where winters were severe, the growing season short, and frugality a paramount virtue. He was a devotee of cod cakes and potatoes, and a strong believer in temperance who began every morning with a tankard of hard cider and a handful of Baptist cakes, which are dough fried in, bits of dough fried in bacon, for his health. <laughs> Not the modern di diet, exactly. <laughs> At first, his wife, Abigail Adams, managed the family farm in Quincy, but John's lonely plaintive letters persuaded her to move down to Washington, Washington to help him turn the shell of a building into a home. Keeping a thrifty eye on her husband's $25,000 salary, Abigail felt duty-bound to host weekly dinners for congressmen 
and their appendages, up to 15 groups a day, she complained in caustic letters to her sisters. The frugal Adamses were astounded by the bountiful parties of their wealthy Southern colleagues, many of whom, such as Jefferson and Madison, owned plantations cultivated by slaves. After one such dinner, Adams marveled with a note of puritanical guilt about everything which could delight the eye or allure the taste. Turtle, flummery, jellies, sweetmeats of 20 sorts, trifles with a dessert of fruits, raisins, almonds, pears, peaches, Parmesan cheese, punch, wine, porter, beer, a most sinful feast. When they entertained, the Adamses served plainer fare, a first course of Indian pudding, a cornmeal porridge sweetened with molasses and smoothed by butter. The second course might be veal, neck of mutton, bacon, and vegetables. Gourmet, it was not, but it was hearty and the best they could do. As we are here, Abigail wrote, we cannot avoid the trouble or the expense. It was clear that the citizens of Washington City expected her to host an official opening reception at the People's House. But slowed by ill health, worried about her son's alcoholism and her husband's disputes with Hamilton and Jefferson, Abigail resisted. She understood that a party in the new mansion would be closely scrutinized and judged. Now, we primates are social creatures biologically engineered for human interaction, psychologists say, and people's hunger for housewarming can be seen as an evolutionary imperative. Like cooking with fire, communal eating was a milestone in human social development. Group meals provide physical, social, and spiritual nutrition and kept early humans from attacking each other for scarce resources. But there was something deeper at work. It turns out that eating and drinking in groups releases endorphins, the naturally occurring opioids that make us feel good. And humans seem to need to eat together, even when we disagree with each other. Since our prehistory, the dining table has been considered a neutral space where weapons are put aside, frank opinions aired, alliances built, deals brokered, marriages arranged, and laughter shared. The ancient phrase, breaking bread, sums it up and is a strategy that has ensured our survival. But breaking bread is not for everybody. The Adams didn't care much about fine food, brilliant social events, or inviting the public into the executive mansion. They liked to stay home and read. Many of their Washington neighbors did, however, a lot, and they weren't shy about it. So finally, on January 1st, 1801, the cerebral administrator and his pragmatic wife capitulated to human desire. And as sometimes happens in history, in the history of the White House, a miscast character was thrust into a critical role. John Adams, the president who didn't care for parties, hosted one of the most significant parties in American history, the opening of the People's House to the people. The short, plump, balding Adams nicknamed his rotundity, dressed in velvet and lace, and stood docilely beside his wife and greeted his fellow Americans. While Abigail, who was married to one of our most outspoken anti-monarchists, received her guest from a throne-like chair, looking for all the world like a queen with a subversive twinkle in her eye. They didn't serve a full meal, but cakes and tarts, syllabub, uh, which is made from heavy cream, sherry, brandy, sugar, and nutmeg, or floating islands, oiled custard topped with meringue, curds, jellies, trifles, sweetmeats, fruits, and bucket loads of tea, coffee, wine, and punch. The party was a roaring success, which inaugurated entertaining at the White House, marked the dawn of a new century, and proved to be Adam's first and last big social event in Washington. In the bitterly fought election of 1800, he lost to his vice president and former friend, the gourmet Thomas Jefferson. To avoid his rival's inauguration, Adams slipped out of Washington in the pre-dawn hours of March 4th and made his way north to Quincy. From his farm, he observes Jefferson's 
pyrotechnic entertaining at the White House with a mix of disdain, confusion, and perhaps a twinge of regret. I held levies once a week that all my time might not be wasted by idle visits, he wrote. Jefferson's whole eight years was a levy. I dined a large company once or twice a week. Jefferson dined a dozen every day. An appropriate beverage. <laughs> Um, our second meal was quite a different affair, a master class in gastro diplomacy orchestrated by the Kennedys. In 1961, after the gray years of the Depression, two world wars in Korea, Americans yearned for something new, polychromatic and exciting. The Kennedy style was a jazzy reflection of the early 60s, but the zing of their parties was as much a result of design as it was the beneficiary of timing. JFK was the, French, the, the front man, movie star handsome, rich, witty, and at 43, the youngest elected president in history. His facilitator was Jackie, a demure, elegant, quietly willful 34-year-old with an instinct for the drama, power, and sheer fun of entertaining on the White House stage. While Jack, had boyish tastes and was partial to fish chowder and ice cream, Jackie was a Francophile who modeled her soirees on Louis XIV, the Sun King of France, who famously used food and entertaining to keep his friends close and his enemies closer. Upgrading the mansion's decor, Mrs. Kennedy transformed the White House into a showcase for great American art and artists, a place to be seen, to see and be seen. Fine dining was central to her vision. With backing from her father-in-law, Joe Kennedy, she hired the French chef René Verdon, and together they raised the cultural bar to a height that has rarely been matched since. The Kennedys hosted a series of famous parties, including the Brains Dinner for Nobel laureates, held wild shindigs aboard the presidential yacht Sequoia, and at a dinner for the French culture minister, Andre Malraux, secured the loan of the Mona Lisa, which set off Mona Mania, a spectacle that drew over a million visitors to Washington and not coincidentally delivered a publicity bonanza to the White House. The Kennedys' parties were a form of soft power, a political and diplomatic seduction, and a champagne-fueled revolution, and they were immensely successful. Perhaps no meal epitomizes this better than the Kennedy's state dinner of July 11th, 1961. Inspired by a magical party they had attended at the Versailles Palace outside of Paris, Jackie was determined to create a similar event in Washington. But where and for who? Well, it happened that General Ayub Khan of the president of Pakistan was scheduled to visit. Pakistan was an important ally and Jackie knew just the spot for her state dinner to end all state dinners. She would do it at Mount Vernon, George Washington's Virginia plantation, due south of Washington on the banks of the Potomac. The fact that a state dinner had never been held outside the White House or that Mount Vernon had minimal electricity, kitchen facilities, and restrooms didn't cloud the First Lady's vision. She had a tent big enough to accommodate 132 guests erected on the lawn. Verdon cooked his meal, a poulet chasseur, which is a chicken with a mushroom sauce, at the White House and had it trucked into Mount Vernon where it was reheated. But as the clock ticked down, portable toilets set amidst poison ivy had to be moved. When mosquitoes held their own state dinner on the workmen, they were sprayed with insecticide but a breeze wafted that poisonous gas towards Verdun's reheating dinner and the staff teetered on the edge of nervous collapse. Smiling like a sphinx, Jackie insisted in a quiet little phrase of iron recalled her social secretary, Letitia Baldridge, of course it can be done. Then the magic began. Guests arrived by flotilla, including a PT boat like the one Jack captained in, in Second World War, and as the sunlight faded to pastel tones, ladies in diaphanous gowns 
flitted across the lawn like butterflies. Candlelight flashed off diamond earrings and a cloud of fireflies added a touch of surreality. Behind this beguiling scene, however, brewed a Cold War intrigue that most guests were unaware of. Just before dinner, Kennedy walked Khan through Washington's garden, alone. Furious that we had given India, his sworn enemy, a billion dollars in aid, the Pakistani had terminated the CIA's secret use of his air bases. But that night, JFK's charm and promises to alert Pakistan of further aid to India and Jackie's sublime mise-en-scene convinced Khan to allow U.S. planes to once again fly from his bases over China to monitor its nuclear program and parachute insurgents into Tibet. And the personal bond that the two leaders formed that night came in handy a year later when China invaded India, an Asian crisis that arrived in the midst of our Cuban Missile Crisis. The Kennedy State Dinner at Mount Vernon was unprecedented, a high-risk, flawlessly executed event that remains legendary and so far unrepeated. Our third presidential dinner tonight took place on a warm evening in Hanoi, Vietnam in May of 2015. And you may have even seen it on television. As the cameras panned down a sleepy, rainy Vietnamese street, US Secret Service agents suddenly parted the crowd. The soundtrack pumped James Brown's The Boss, and America's first black president stepped out of a limousine, beaming and loose. As a surprise cheering crowd gathered, Barack Obama grinned and said, hey, how you doing, guys? It was a dramatic entrance. His host, the TV chef, cultural reporter, professional bad boy, Anthony Bourdain, dressed in his uniform of blue jeans and desert boots, led Obama into a roadside diner. There, the lanky president and even lankier TV host sat on blue plastic stools, drank beer, and ate bun cha, which is spicy noodles and pork, as if they were just two regular guys out on the town. Demonstrating how to lubricate the noodles with broth, Bourdain said, slurping is totally acceptable. Get ready to enjoy the awesomeness. This is outstanding, enthused Obama, heaping more hot chili peppers into his bowl. Now people know that he was the son of a black Kenyan father and a white Irish American mother from Wichita, Kansas, and that Barack was raised in Honolulu, where he and his mother sometimes relied on food stamps. But Obama also spent formative years in Jakarta, Indonesia, and later in food mad cities like Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, and here in Cambridge when he was at Harvard Law. And so by the time he moved into the White House at age 47, Barack Obama had the most globally informed palate of any president with the possible exception of Herbert Hoover. And you'll have to read about him in the book. <laughs> When the White House advisor Ben Rhodes prepped Tony Bourdain in Hanoi, he said, the president's philosophy isn't that different from yours. If people would just sit down and eat together and understand something about each other, maybe they could figure things out. The bun cha cost a grand total of $6. I picked up the check, Bourdain tweeted puckishly, and it would appear on Parts Unknown, his show, in 2016. It became one of the Obama's most successful bits of social outreach and went around the world instantly. The Vietnamese ambassador to the US was more excited by Barack and Tony eating in, in Hanoi than been any of the diplomatic agreements he'd negotiated with the US. As they swig beer like two dads in Southeast Asia enthusiasts, Obama recalled, Obama recalled one of his favorite childhood dinners the grilled carp with bitter rice he'd eaten on a highway rest stop in Indonesia. It was the simplest meal possible, he said, and nothing tasted so good. Off camera, Bourdain wondered if his friendship with the rocker Ted Nugent, who has said many, many deeply offensive things about Obama, was acceptable. Of course, the president replied, those who disagree with us are exactly the kind of people we should be talking to noting that John Kerry and John McCain made peace with their former Vietnamese enemies, presumably over food. He added, 
You don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. Progress is not a straight line. There are going to be moments where things are terrible. But having said all that, I think, th I think things are going to work out. After Bourdain's death in 2018, Obama tweeted, Tony taught us about food, but more importantly, about its ability to bring us together, to make us a little less afraid of the unknown. And this is the point about breaking bread together. It provides a human moment when leaders can get to know each other as individuals and not simply as stick figure stand-ins for their cause or party or nation. So why should we care? Why is the food of politics important? Well, the president is our eater in chief. His diet determines his health on which the fate of the nation and potentially the world rests and the public pays attention to what he eats. So when the Kennedys ate French-inspired food and Julia Child trumpeted Chef René Verdon in the 1960s, many Americans followed suit. Likewise, when the Obamas modeled healthy eating, many people planted gardens and ate fresh vegetables. And when Donald Trump hosted his burger banquet in the state dining room, people ate more fast food. By the way, Trump's burgers were a shrewd bit of political theater. Like Reagan's jelly beans, those images of him and his burgers helped define Trump's presidency. And the message was similarly clear. I like fast food. You like fast food. Vote for me. When it comes to the politics of food, Bourdain was famous for saying, nothing is more political than food. Nothing. Now, this can be true in the positive sense in that politics is the art of compromise, and dining together is one of the best ways to achieve unity. But it can also be negative in that partisan disputes are amplified by things like cost, taste, and social connotations. Food has had a political tinge since the colonial days when cooking with British recipes, French technique, African herbs and spices, and native ingredients such as corn, turkey, and cod helped to define America and its distinct fusion cookery. The revolution was sparked in part by the Boston Tea Party. And as your president here, Catherine Al Gore notes, it unfolded in a series of conversations taking place at a dinner table. Today, disagreements over local organic so-called little food systems versus multinational processed big ag systems have devolved into scorched earth politics. As Obama discovered when his ambitious antitrust investigation of cattle and seed companies was stopped cold by a $9 million lobbying campaign and a recalcitrant Congress. On the other hand, George W. Bush was publicly aligned with corporate food interests and once notoriously served a not tasty or healthy prepackaged food made by a big donor, much to the disgust of the White House chefs, but in private, his wife Laura and daughters, much like Hillary Clinton, shopped for organic vegetables and ate healthily. The food industry is the largest sector of our economy, and in theory, America has enough bounty to feed every citizen. But in practice, that doesn't work. And we don't have a single coordinated method for administering our food supply as places like Brazil and Mexico do. As a result, we suffer poor nutrition in some places and overabundance in others. Our reliance on fossil fuels leads to the pollution of air, land, and water. Corn and, so and soybean subsidies have fed, have fed millions of people, but that food tends to be sweet, salty, and fatty, which contribute to disease. And some 40% of that production is devoted to animal feed or ethanol. COVID demonstrated that the consolidation of food production left us vulnerable to supply chain meltdowns. But at heart, these are all political issues. The president is our chief politician, and one of his most important jobs is to resolve the food conundrum. Today, the nation is once again riven by partisan divisions, and our representatives have pulled their chairs away from the communal table, seeming to forget the strength and primal imperative of breaking bread together. Fewer deals are brokered over congressional lunches or a drink after work. And the bipartisan cocktail parties that once glued Washington DC together are withering. 
But I have hope that we are slowly returning to the nation's table, relearning how to disagree agreeably and build compromise, which is, after all, the art of gastropolitics. Or, as Jill Biden's Italian grand grandfather liked to say, no matter our arguments during dinner, we finish as family. Or at least, I think you're dead wrong, but let's put it aside so we can enjoy the pleasures of life together. Thank you. I'm sure Alex would be happy to answer questions if people have any questions. Questions or stories. I'm always collecting stories. Hi, um, I was curious, why did you choose those specific 26 presidents? Is it um, the records that you had? Was those the ones that interest you? Like, what was your reasoning behind those 26? Good question. So, um, okay, why did I, so I, in this book, I cover 26 presidents, not all 46. Um, my initial thought was, well, to do all 46 would make a giant encyclopedia and it would probably not be not that interesting. Uh, so I wanted to pick the most compelling presidents and the most compelling meals. And the meals were important um, because I wanted to show different facets of the White House uh, and, and the presidency. And so I tried to make each chapter slightly different about a different aspect of what it means to eat at the White House and, 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 the, and the politics of food also. And, uh, and then when it came to the presidents themselves, uh, my ambition is to reach a wide audience with this book. And so I kind of tried to pick the greatest hits. Um, there are plenty of presidents um, with food stories who are kind of unknown. Um, and I just felt that they didn't all have great enough stories that it really made a difference. And uh, I quickly learned that virtually every president has a good food story. Um, and each of these chapters in my book could have been a book because there, some of these people are just unbelievable. <laughs> um, and one of the themes that began to emerge uh, as I did my research was that I began to think of presidential hunger writ large. So there's hunger for food, of course, but there's also a hunger for power uh, or influence. Uh, some people have a kind of a righteous sense of duty. Uh, there's also carnal pleasure that plays into a number of uh, administrations. And so uh, this notion of presidential hunger began to help me winnow away. Um, you know, I was fascinated by somebody like Woodrow Wilson, for example, who is this tall, uh, thin um, uh, guy who looks like a minister um, who uh, had a very nervous stomach. Uh, during the First World War, every time a battle occurred, he'd have a terrible upset. And he'd have to go lie down. Uh, he could barely attend the Paris peace talks because his stomach was acting up. And yet he carried on this wild personal life and he had girlfriends and he was chasing women. He had two wives. And um, it's kind of these personalities tend to be outsized. Um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt uh, only lived to be age 60, but he led about 15 different lives. If you look at his history, it's incredible. Uh, and and the, the way I read the history is he essentially ate himself to death. Um, and the psychological backstory to that that I found interesting is that his father um, had a stomach cancer and it was very painful and it was his stomach and he couldn't eat and he withered away and died. And so Teddy went the opposite direction and just ate and ate and he knew that he was unhealthy and he knew he had a bad heart, but it was compulsive and he couldn't stop. Um, and there's some actually some sort of funny stories about him sneaking off and snacking here and there. Um, I tell the story about after his presidency, when he went on this grand safari in Africa, and he insisted on eating an elephant's heart, because that was supposed to give you strength and power. And so these guys, uh, and unfortunately, they're all guys so far, but you know, we're waiting for the women. Uh, it's going to happen soon, I have a feeling. Um, and, uh, you know, they're all unusual people, and often their tastes are unusual. Uh, they have quirky individual tastes. So Richard Nixon, for example, uh, every single day for lunch, liked to eat a little dollop of cottage cheese. Sometimes he would dress it up with ketchup, or he would put it on a pineapple ring. And I have a very sad picture in my book of the pineapple ring with cottage cheese. <laughs> And yet the same guy 
uh, held the first and until recently only White House conference on food. Uh, he quintupled the amount of uh, money going into food stamps. And then he went to China in 1972 and uh, proved that he could use chopsticks and eat things like chicken gizzards, which kind of blew everybody's mind. Um, and so again, he was this man of great contradiction. So I found these stories um, really compelling because they tell us about the presidents as quirky individuals, as human beings, not these godlike figures that we revere uh, in school. Um, and the, you know, the, what they eat, the public, as I mentioned, emulates, and their food policies are super important, not only for America, but for the world. So I tried to find the stories and, the, and match them with the presidents that would tell us um, a kind of a panoramic view of the food of the White House. And, and these presidents are brought up on, on, on different cultures. We had Lyndon Johnson, you know, who told Salinger, eat your beans, <laughs> you know? And so I just think it was a, a, a very, they, they brought it with them to the White House. And unless they had a, a lady beside them, like Jackie, who could say, look, this, this is all wrong. This is, this, is, this is the way to do it. And we, ha we haven't seen that really since the Kennedy administration, I think. Well, I would disagree with that, but that's a, it's a good point. Um, the LBJ is an interesting case. Uh, he inherited his presidency. Uh, he also inherited Chef René Verdun, the French, very, very fine French chef I mentioned. But um, the Johnsons liked down-home Texas cooking. Um, they didn't care for this fancy French stuff. And Verdun quit in a huff because he said, you do not serve the ladies in white gloves, the spare ribs. Uh, so Johnson loved uh, barbecued ribs and he loved chili. Uh, and the chili he liked the most was called Pedernales chili. Pedernales, the Pedernales River runs through his ranch uh, in, in, in central Texas. Uh, and the chili was attributed to Lady Bird Johnson. But the real author of that recipe was a woman named Zephyr Wright who was their black personal cook. Uh, she was a very uh, down to earth woman from central Texas uh, who had no intention of going to the White House, uh, but they brought her from Texas to the White House and she would cook in the private quarters on the second floor of the White House and she would make the down home food they like. Um, once uh, Verdun quit, uh, they hired a Swiss chef named Henry Holler who was a good friend of Julia Child's, and he lasted the longest of, of any of the White House chefs. He lasted through five administrations, and he was willing to cook anything for anybody, um, which is kind of what you have to do because you serve uh, the president and the first family. But uh, Johnson's uh, favorite trick was he, he would use food in a very intentional way, much like Jackie Kennedy did, but in a different way. He would pay, take people out to uh, the ranch, and uh, first he'd give them a, a little horseback ride around and soften them up a bit. Then he'd give them some beer. Then he'd give them some ribs or some chili and some cornbread and maybe a little whiskey. And then he'd move in for the kill. And he'd say, now, boy, I want you to do me a favor. And it was very hard to resist <laughs> this six foot seven guy who had just plied you with this wonderful Texas food. Uh, and it was very effective. And he, he was particularly effective with European diplomats who had this notion of the 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 veiled veiled vest you know the, the grand cowboy and this was the era when the marlboro man was first started to being used as a as a, as a marketing uh, tool and this notion of you know the louis de l'amour uh, cowboy novels were big my grandfather used to read those things and um you know it was this rugged american out there and and he um very smartly used that trope um, but again, like I said, um, you know, um, the Obamas were big foodies and, um, and, I, and I think Trump was actually very smart to, to use fast food as a, as a selling point. Um, and we may, I may not agree with that as a, as a White House worthy cuisine, but his voters sure did and, and responded. So some of his voters, yeah, well. <laughs> Oh, I'm here. I was wondering, since in your speech, which one gave the drunken, the drunken speech? <laughs> ah. And two, during the Depression, what did they serve? 
and the cooks or the chefs? Like, mm. can you tell me more about sure. the chefs? Well, uh, the famous, the infamous drunken speech was Andrew Johnson, who was uh, Lincoln's vice president. Um, and as vice president, he was uh, asked to give a speech and he had a stomach virus. And the uh, remedy in those days was to drink a couple of shots of whiskey. And he had a weak head for booze. And so he shows up for this speech in this enormous crowd and he's slurring his words and he's talking about his child and people started to boo him. Uh, and, and it was, it, it was um, uh, he became known as a drunk. And even when he inherited the presidency, he could never escape that label. The other one that was interesting um, who never gave a drunken speech, but uh, whose entire life was almost derailed by alcoholism was U.S. Grant. Famously, infamously, the poor guy. Um, yeah, you know, he was this rough and tumble guy from Missouri um, who was uh, a rising star in the army, but then was cashiered once his superiors found out that he had a drinking issue, which only happened when he was away from his wife and kids for extended periods of time. He would get blue and he would go on these binges and he wasn't drinking for pleasure. He was drinking to obliterate himself. And he would just get, he would pass out. He would punch people in the nose. He would turn into a different person. He had like this molten personality that would come out. Um, and they, they canned him. Uh, and he ended up um, failing a number of businesses, including he ended up selling firewood on the corner in, in St. Louis, uh, which is so sad. But then, ironically, the Civil War came along and resurrected him, saved him, and he became the head of the army. And then he became the president. Um, but he always had this demon of alcohol on his shoulder, and he really fought it. He would go to, to meetings, uh, and he would talk about it. He was very open, um, and he would... You know, when you're president, there's so many temptations. Oh, just have a glass of champagne. You know, we're going to celebrate, blah, blah, blah. And he would just say, no, nope, I can't do it. Um, and But he would smoke uh, 12 to 15 cigars a day. And he, he was an expert horseman. And he had these super, it was, like having a, it was like having a sports car at the White House. He had these super horses. And he goes zooming around Washington and actually got a speeding ticket at one point and insisted on paying it. Um, and that's how he took that energy out uh, in unusual ways. And the, the interesting thing about the grants, um, there are many funny, they, they were one of the presidents um, that I was not expecting to use but when I started this project, but I got so interested in them uh, they became much more nuanced uh, than I realized. And the same with Dwight Eisenhower, people who I thought I knew their story. And then I did the research and I realized they were much more complicated. Um, and the grants um, ended up, they came to the White House with a quartermaster, you know, from the military cooking like giant slabs of roast beef and turkey. And, 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 and the president was fine with that. But the first lady, Julia Grant, was not fine with that. She had social aspirations. Uh, and so she eventually cashiered that guy and she got a guy named Valentino Mela, who was a Sicilian, who was a wonderful chef known as the professor uh, because he knew culinary history and is this wonderful cook. And he um, would produce these 30 odd course meals paired with delicious wines and the, and the grants got pretty used to that. They really liked it. And they started eating these. Uh, he used to have uh, coffee and a cucumber for breakfast. That's when... <laughs> Military guy, right? Well, by the end of his uh, administration, he was having kippered herring and three different kinds of eggs and so on. Um, and um, and actually, the Grants from Missouri, the sort of rough and tumble folks, were the first people to use a state dinner uh, for a foreign dignitary, and they set the pattern then for what the state dinners are like today. And their first guest was not the King of England or the Czar of Russia. Uh, it was King Kalakaua of the Sandwich Islands, uh, now known as Hawaii. Uh, and King Kalakaua had a problem, which was he was a king and his kingdom was falling apart and he had a lot of sugar and he wanted to sell it to the United States, but we had very high tariffs blocking him. So he comes to Washington and beseeches U.S. Grant uh, to lower the tariffs. Now, you know, Grant was a strategic thinker and he thought, hmm, okay, I'll grant you that. Uh, but you've got to open Pearl Harbor up to us as a naval base. And a lot of the Hawaiians uh, worried that that would be the beginning of the end of their, of their kingdom. And then eventually they were right. Um, but Kalakaua was feted uh, at the White House. There's a big parade in Washington. And then Mela made this extraordinary meal, um, uh, uh, the, the menu for which doesn't exist any longer, but we can infer 
because it was, you know, 32 or 34 courses and, um, and Kalakaua loved it, but he came with two food tasters, these stone faced guys who sat on either side of him and tasted all the food to make sure he wasn't going to get poisoned. Um, but they concluded the deal and they, they lowered the tariffs and, and, and uh, eventually uh, set the pattern for uh, a very rich trade between Hawaii and the US. And this is a, one of the, the, the themes of the book is that there's always a, a backstory to these state dinners. It's either an economic story or a diplomatic story. There's something else going on, which is why I like that Kennedy state dinner because Jackie has created this wonderful scene at Mount Vernon and there's all this history there. And Jack is working the politics behind the scene. And, and that's kind of the essence of the food of politics and the politics of food. We have some questions online. Um, you mentioned the tasters. Somebody had a question about the history of, of that. And then- Of, of food tasters? Is that what you- Yes. Think? Yeah. And then Greg also asked if you have any stories about John Quincy Adams. Um, food tasters is something that, that um, I looked into. You know, it's, it's very hard to know the truth behind that. I've been told various stories and then I've been told that those weren't true. Uh, so I kind of left that aside because um, uh, I've been told that even recently there have been food tasters. Somebody said that Obama had a food taster, but then I, I have, I've now become friends with some of the White House cooks and they said, no, no, that's not true. So I don't know. Uh, I think that that was certainly true. I know as up to Reagan, there were food tasters. Uh, uh, my friend Corby Cummer, who's a food writer, who's based here, he writes for the Atlantic. Uh, he... Um, he was in Venice with Reagan when there uh, was, a, was a there was a, a some kind of a diplomatic meeting, group of eight maybe, and uh, he saw the food taster. But don't forget, Reagan had been shot by Hinckley, uh, and Nancy was deathly afraid that he was going to be killed because there's something known as the White House curse, which is that roughly every 20 years, uh, a, a president would be assassinated, and he was almost assassinated. I mean, it it, it ended up. Um, very close. Um, and I tell the story in the book uh, because she, Nancy, used food to revive Ronnie. It's uh, uh, the special soups that he liked. And, and it's kind of a poignant story. Um, but I don't know that much about the food tasters because people, I, I get so much contradictory information. And I think partly that's on purpose because the security of White House food is, is very tight, as you might imagine. Now, that wasn't always the case. For years, people would send foodstuffs to the White House. Um, uh, notoriously, people would send giant cheeses, like 250 pounds of giant cheese, um, to sort of impress the president, uh, get some publicity for themselves, curry favor. Um, the most notorious of those uh, was Andrew Jackson, who was a populist, much like Trump, um, who invited the mob to come over to the White House and eat the cheese. And the mob also had a few things to drink. And they completely, not only they devour the cheese, but they trashed the White House and ground the cheese into the carpets and they ripped down the curtains and they went kind of crazy. <laughs> and um, they had to fumigate the White House and air it out because it just smelled like rotting cheese. <laughs> um, the, more, the, the better story is, I think, is the, uh, the, the famous presidential salmon, which um, was, uh, came from Maine every year, the first salmon um, that was caught. Uh, would be sent to the White House as a tribute to the president. Um, and um, this went on for 100, well, more than 100 years uh, until, unfortunately, the rivers became dammed and polluted, and, and now the Atlantic salmon are in danger. Um, but the Atlantic, the, but the, the presidential salmon, um, now see, each of these stories has a, another a sub story. So my favorite salmon was the one given to Herbert Hoover, uh, who was a big foodie and a fisherman. Um, and um, so the Mainers sent this delicious looking salmon, but Herbert Hoover was an engineer and he got everybody at the White House to be very efficient. And so the, the kitchen got the salmon, they quickly gutted it, beheaded it, put it in the freezer, got it ready for dinner. Uh, but then the Senator from Maine showed up and he wanted a photograph of the president with the salmon. So they fished around in the garbage, got the head out, sewed it back on, took the picture. <laughs> and that was the end of that story. So uh, uh, John Quincy Adams, I don't really have a story. Sorry. So uh, my question is a question framing. Um, last month, 
Boston Globe had a, a documentary and then a talk back about uh, Phil, um, James Hemings, mm -hmm. Sally Hemings' brother, yep. um, uh, Thomas Jefferson's enslaved chef, who went with him to um, Paris and learned how to cook in that high high tradition. Yep. And so it was sort of an interesting story about techniques he learned, brought back that he had. And then my curiosity, he was not offered the letter he wanted to be the White House chef. He wanted the specific letter to give him this position. He also and, wanted some specific money too. Well, that too, but the, <laughs> he wanted the, the uh, acknowledgement that that's what he would be. Yeah. Um, that anyway, that there's a tragic story behind that. But um, th so this, the Paris trained chefs and that as a thing. So you mentioned that, that the Kennedys had that, but sort of was was the tradition in between with that also that Paris trained chefs were used. Um, okay, so the story is really about French cooks uh, at the White House over the years. Uh, in the early years, um, there were an, quite a few French chefs, and they were sort of guns for hire. They'd come; they, these guys had great skills, and they were in much demand, uh, not only from the by the president, but also by wealthy households all across America, uh, particularly along the eastern coast. And so they would uh, uh, go; uh, they would work for hire, and they would sometimes be caterers, or they would become on staff. Um, so Thomas Jefferson, in fact, had a, a series of French chefs um, and trained his black slave cooks, uh, not only James Hemings, uh, but also um, uh, a series of black women chefs uh, who were who became really skilled, um, which was very unusual. Um, the story quickly about James Hemings was he was a young uh, slave boy at Monticello. Uh, Jefferson was the ambassador to Paris. He brings Hemings with him. Um, he trains him at some of Paris's finest kitchens. He, uh, Hemings becomes essentially a three-star chef. He also becomes almost fluent in French. He speaks French better than Jefferson. Um, and he becomes literate. He can read, he can write, which was unusual for a slave. He comes back to the States. He cooks these wonderful meals. And I actually opened the book with a meal cooked by James Hemings, uh, which was... Um, um, it's referenced in the musical Hamilton, but I'll let you read about that. Um, and then tragically, um, well, first of all, Hemings, uh, Jefferson started to pay Hemings and Hemings bought his freedom, uh, which was also very unusual. Um, he didn't want to work for Jefferson because he didn't get the letter, but he also didn't, wasn't gonna make the money that he wanted to. And, and he felt that Jefferson wasn't respecting him. And Jefferson felt that Hemings was rootless because he was traveling and spending his money and drinking too much. And he was trying to give him a, a home. And they had a conflicting view of, uh, of their roles. So James ended up working at a, at a tavern in Baltimore and tragically just didn't fit in the world as it was. He was not fully black or white. Um, he was this highly trained chef but he was a slave, former slave. He could speak French. He traveled around the world. Uh, and so he never really fit in. He, his, sexu his sexuality uh, may have been fluid. And, and uh, I think that ultimately he began to numb himself by drinking and drinking. He ultimately um, died at age 38, I think from alcohol poisoning, essentially. So it's a really a tragic story, but it should be a movie because it's so dramatic and it tells you so much about the beginning of American cuisine. And I mentioned in my talk, this fusion cooking that happened in the early days, which was initially called Virginia cooking, which was really uh, a combination of Jefferson's vision, because he was a real epicure. Uh, he really understood food and how to use it. Um, and Jefferson's uh, and, and James Hemings skill. Uh, so the two of them were an amazing team and they would create that they created this fusion cooking where uh, James used his um, French technique with a lot of British recipes, these indigenous um, ingredients, uh, his own um, inspiration, and then some of the herbs and spices that, from the African tradition. And this was this, this amazing cuisine. Um, French-inflected um, American cooking, which is kind of the basis for what we eat now, although we're even more fusion now. Um, and it's a great metaphor for the country when you think about that these strands kind of coming together. In terms of the French chefs, um, there was a long period when um, the French chefs were out of favor and there were sort of army quartermasters like US Grants um, or um, sort of anonymous women chefs, sometimes black, sometimes white. Um, I do highlight some of the cooks like Valentino Mela um, who have these interesting personal stories. 
Um, and, um, you know, Jackie Kennedy really reinvigorated the French tradition with René Verdun. Uh, and then Henry Holler, who was trained in France partly, uh, took over. Um, and um, he was followed by a couple of American cooks and um, but people who are mostly trained in France. So the French tradition is still alive and well. And the woman who is the current chef is Christetta Comerford, who's a Filipina. Um, uh, she's about five foot two and just got this look in her eye that you would not want to get between her and the stove. Uh, <laughs> she'd carve you up. Uh, and she's a remarkable cook, but, but, but um, like uh, Henry Holler, she's willing to cook whatever the president and first lady want. Um, some of these cooks have these dramatic personalities. They're as dramatic as the president's. Um, her predecessor, Walter Scheib, was one such. Uh, and he really bonded with the Clintons because they wanted a, a new fusion cooking for the new century. Um, they wanted it lighter because Bill had a bad heart. He'd been eating all this junk food. Hillary was trying to get him away from that. So Walter Scheib brings in this kind of Asian and Latin inflected uh, fusion cooking. Uh, they bring in people like Dr. Dean Ornish, who's a cardiologist, uh, to advise, and they create these menus. And they really bring a new kind of food to the White House. Um, and then um, W comes in. Uh, he has plainer tastes, more Texas-themed things. Um, you know, he liked a grilled cheese uh, for lunch, um, whereas Hillary would have some fabulous, you know, spicy concoction that Chai would bring and, and Laura Bush, um, you know, she had sort of country club tastes. Um, and I think that Scheib grew increasingly frustrated and started to kind of act out. And it didn't help that he was having a war with the pastry chef, uh, the French Roland Mesnier, uh, even though they shared a tiny office, they hated talking to each other. So they would leave little notes. Um, so it's like a soap opera, right? You know, uh, and, uh, and um, Scheib ended up uh, being eased out, uh, saying it wasn't worth that Laura Bush said it wasn't working out, whereupon he did the unthinkable, which was instead of telling the press that he was uh, going to pursue other things, he blew up and he said, she fired me and I'm not loved and, you know, and like, and, and that was it for him. He kind of burned every bridge he ever had. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and he ended up having a, a tragic death also. But these stories, you know, again, I mean, truth is stranger than fiction. You cannot make this stuff up. And, and I just found this so compelling. And, 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 and so it was really hard for me when I was first composing the book, uh, structuring it. I, you know, I wanted to do everybody because, and I just, and I had to leave a lot on the cutting room floor. Uh, so I haven't decided how to use that stuff, uh, but I will at some point. Stay tuned. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you. Actually, this is, this has been marvelous, and and I did want to ask you about Jefferson, so mm. so that got answered. But um, a couple of things: can you uh, talk to where and how the food is sourced? Um, is it gardens in the White House grounds, or coming in from you know all over? And then also to the to your uh, thesis of food being a source of politics and vice versa. Um, can you talk to when, um, I guess it was Franklin Roosevelt offered hot dogs, was it, to the uh, king and queen yeah. of uh, yeah. England? Yeah, well, I'll answer the hot dog question first. So uh, this is a, a famous story. Uh, FDR was a real epicure. Um, tragically, his wife, Eleanor, was not, uh, which was uh, almost guaranteed to provide marital tension. Um, and there was a uh, soap opera-esque subplot to that, which I'll let you read about. Um, and uh, But FDR understood how to use food in a political way, much like Jefferson and Jackie Kennedy did. And so in 1939, uh, he saw Nazi Germany rising and he, thought, he saw this as a great danger and he wanted to join the allies, but there was an isolationist block here that um, denied him that. Um, and so uh, he was trying to figure out ways to rekindle the relationship, this, what they call the special relationship with Great Britain. Now, we had given uh, Britain a lot of uh, aid, food, and, and, and monetary aid during the First World War, and um, a lot of Americans felt that they had not repaid their debts. So, so we were not favorably inclined uh, to, to uh, the kingdom, and uh, particularly to the royals, uh, who we considered to be these... 
uh, pretentious monarchs in gold crowns, swilling claret, and um, uh, and uh, FDR noticed in the newspaper that that King George and Queen Elizabeth, the Windsors, were taking a tour of Canada. So he invited them down to Hyde Park, his place just north of New York City on the Hudson River, his home uh, where he grew up. It's a it's an incredible mansion, which you should all visit when you get a chance. It's, it's weird, um, but very cool. Um, and uh, he invited them down for a simple picnic, um, which he had carefully calculated for maximum effect. And his, his agenda was to humanize the Windsors, uh, to make them not these royals eating Yorkshire pudding and roast beef, but like regular human beings that Americans could relate to uh, and therefore uh, as symbols of the nation, uh, they could uh, they could support Great Britain. Uh, and instead of serving some fancy deal, meal, he served them hot dogs with beer. Uh, and as he uh, intended, the, the newspapers went crazy. And there's a great New York Times headline that says, King eats hot dog and asks for more. And he actually drinks beer, you know. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was a great success. Um, and then in terms of sourcing, um, uh, the food of the White House after 9-11, uh, all these gifts that people have been sending, they were cut off. Those, everything you send to the White House now is just automatically destroyed, which is, is really too bad. Um, but um, what happens is that there are certain very carefully vetted um, providers all around Washington, and all they know is that they are providing the U.S. government. They don't know that they're providing the White House specifically. And the food goes to a warehouse uh, or maybe more than one warehouse, nobody would tell me. Uh, and I, I understand that. Um, and um, then the chefs um, make a, a procurement uh, uh, order based on the menus that they've worked out with the First Lady and, and the State Department. Uh, and, and they can get very fine food if they like, but the, but the vendors don't know who they're giving it to. Um, and it's all very tightly controlled. And anybody who blabs is immediately canned. Um, and so... Um, you know, understandably, after 9-11, it, it's been very tight. So anyway, I think we've reached the end of our, our hour. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll be out here. Uh, I'd be happy to sign a book and inscribe it if you'd like. And we hope that our, our visitors joining us online will buy books uh, through their favorite online retailer. Thank you very That's much. True, and if you buy a book online, um, I'd be happy to send a, a book plate to you. You can reach me through my website, which is alexprudum.com, and uh, just send me a note with your address, and I'd be happy to, to sign a book plate for you. So, thank you.